And think about that. I think that was a coincidence. I'm telling you, when we, when we as a nation turn to the Lord, His blessing is just on us. And um, so 2023, here at Calvary, we're calling it the year of the Bible. And I would love for you all to have the same study Bible that I use. This is the ESV study Bible. And uh, we want, we're going to buy it. We've already bought a bunch. We're going to buy more um, between first and second service. I don't know how many we, we need, but we want a bunch. Um, if you would put your name on a tithing envelope, just write it on there. It's a, it's a suggested donation of $20, okay? So for people like Bill, it means you need to put 100 in. And for others, it means you need to put in a dollar. So it's the widow's might. Give according to the way that you've been blessed. But would you, yeah, we want you all that husbands and wives, I'd love for you to have the same Bible. We're going to read through the epistles in, sometimes in one setting, not in church, but during the week. We want to just eat this together. And I want to try to teach through all of the epistles in the New Testament in 2023. So um, if you know me, know, you know that's almost an impossibility, but we're going to give it a, a go. So, but I'd love for you all to have the same Bible. So tithing envelope, I don't see too many people grabbing them. Would you grab them now? Take them out, put your name on them, uh, and then put them in the bucket on the way out. So we've been in this series titled Grow For It for a long time now, and um, the last three weeks, we kind of had a mini-series within the series uh, on how a growing, not a mature, but a maturing, growing follower of Jesus cherishes, loves, develops unity. And we listed three necessary ingredients for us to have unity. And last week, we talked about the tongue. And if we're going to build unity and cherish unity in the house of God, we have to learn how to tame our tongue. And everybody said, amen, right? Yeah. The Bible says a lot about the tongue. And a lot of it isn't so good. James says it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison, setting a forest on fire and set it on fire itself by hell. And Proverbs says very similar things. And then James says, no human can tame the tongue. And we would all say amen to that. When I was a youth pastor, I did a couple messages on the power of a tongue, and I thought I needed a, 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 an analogy or an illustration. So I went to the butcher shop, and I bought a cow's tongue. And I'd never had a cow's tongue before. And I started looking at the thing. Man, they're hideous looking. And I thought, I can't take that to youth group with me. So I decided I would cook the cow's tongue. And uh, I boiled it. I didn't know what you do with a cow's tongue. But I can tell you, when you boil a cow's tongue, it doubles in size. And so, you know, I mean, this thing, it looked like a big lizard. I mean, it was just hideous looking. And I never forgot that analogy, but Rich was in my youth group and he forgot it. So for however thought, good I thought it was, I guess it wasn't that good. But man, our tongues, don't you sometimes wish you could just roll it back up inside? You know, it's like, oh gosh, I'd like to tame, take that stuff back. But James said, no human can tame it. But thanks be to God, the Holy Spirit can tame our tongues. Amen. As we surrender them to him. And we made three points about a tame tongue. One is a tame tongue is one that treasures something different. When we, we hoard, we treasure what we value. And if we are hoarding unforgiveness or jealousy or vengeance or anger or whatever it might be, the Bible says, Jesus said, out of the abundance or the treasure of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't keep it in there. You'll betray your heart. Eventually, it'll just come out. And a tame tongue is one that learns to treasure different things. We learn to treasure gentleness or humility or kindness. We learn to treasure godliness and righteousness. And then you know what happens when we begin to collect and hoard those things in our heart, good things, good things come out of our mouth. We learn to treasure different things, we learn to choose our words differently when we have a tame tongue. We learn to choose gracious words, words that build up, words that edify. And thirdly, we said that a tame tongue is a tongue that knows when to be quiet. Sometimes we need to just zip it, right? Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. You know, I, as a pastor, a lot of times you get in the habit of just, 
you know, sharing your heart with people, giving them advice and counsel, and, you know, you see them doing things that you don't think they should do. And the, the Lord reminds me all the time that he's a better Holy Spirit than I am. And the same is true for you. Sometimes we just have to be quiet. So uh, a tongue that's tamed is a tongue that builds unity in the house of God. Today, we're going to move on to the next topic in this Grow For It series. We're going to talk about um, the part of giving. Uh, a growing, maturing follower of Jesus is one who gives, who gives of their time, their resources, their talents, their service. It's a, it's a measure of if you're growing in the Lord by how much you are giving. It's something that the New Testament church practiced. They all gave the old people gave, the widows gave, the young people gave. They, they, they had great need. They had to give because they were under such duress, under such persecution. The Bible says in Acts 4.22 that they had everything in common. The reason they had everything in common, that's not just material possessions. They had everything in common because they had to have it in common in order to survive. Hebrews says that they joyfully surrendered the plundering of their property. There was so much opposition against the New Testament church that they had to share everything just to make it. But the same is true of us. If we're going to make it the way that God wants us to make it, have the impact that God wants us to have, we have to learn to give. A growing, maturing follower of Jesus gives. Now, this is not a sermon about... I have friends that are in the ministry and they, they say, Kirk, you're crazy. You should pass the bucket. People give more. Uh, you should have a mini sermon before every, every offering is taken. I'm like, we don't do any of those things. And God has blessed our church abundantly. We had our business meeting Wednesday night. I, I don't really track how much money comes in the door. I know I should, but I don't pay attention to that. I don't know who gives what. I, I don't know who our top five givers are, our top 10 givers. I don't know, and I don't want to know. But I was surprised to find out that um, almost a million dollars came through the doors of our church last year, the last fiscal year. I had no idea. I know how much comes in the offering because I do track that. But a million dollars. Look, I don't, we don't need your money. Well, yeah, give him praise for that, but, but I, we, don't, we don't need your money here. We're not talking about giving because we need your money. We're talking about giving because that's a sign of a growing follower of Jesus. But before we can talk about giving of our time or our service or our finances, before we can talk about any kind of giving, we have to first answer the question of who owns it. Is it, do, am I the one that owns it in the first place? Am I just giving a gift to God because I'm so thankful for what he's done in my life? That's not a bad thing. Lots of times we give gifts to people because we're just so blessed by them. Like I, I want to just tell you how much you mean to me, how much I appreciate you, how much you've done for me, and I'm going to give you a gift and I don't want anything back. You ever have a friend that you can't outgive? It seems like you give them something, they give you something back. It's like, no, don't give me nothing back. I want to just bless you. You've been so good to me. There's no strings attached. I, I don't want you to pay more attention to me. I don't want you to remember what I gave you on your birthday so I get more on my birthday or Christmas. I, I don't want, I'm just giving to you because you mean so much to me. That's a great way to give. And quite frankly, I would give to God for that reason alone. He he is worthy of everything that I have. <laughs> I wouldn't have anything except for the blessing and favor of God. If God wouldn't have changed my life and the trajectory of my life and my heart and my attitude, I would have nothing. I would be a total... Now, some people would have lots of things, but I would not. I would be a total failure without Jesus Christ in my life. That's just the direction I was going. So all that I have belongs to him. I thank him for it. Like, God, there's so many times I just walk around my own house and I just think, God, you've been so good to me. Thank you. I want to give it back to you because you're worthy of it all. Is that what we're doing when we're giving? Am I giving God a gift because I'm so grateful? Or am I giving God something back that he's already given to me? 
It's a question of ownership. You, you can't talk about serving without understanding who owns it. It's not a bad thing to give a gift. But when we give to God, we're actually giving back to him something that he gave to us in the first place. He owns it all. The Bible says in Psalm 40, 11, God said, who has first given to me anything that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. I like that. God saying, just, just, is there anyone who's ever lived that's given to me something first? No, I gave it to them first. The Bible says in Psalms, God said, um, all the beasts of the field are mine, even the cattle on a thousand hills. As I read that earlier this week, I was thinking of all you guys that go out and you, you hunt and you kill big animals and you put them on your wall. And I was thinking, you, you have that thing hanging on your wall. You need to put underneath it. God gave me this. It belonged to him in the first place. You, whether, the Bible says a sparrow can't fall without God knowing about it. And how good is our God that he would give us all the beasts of the field? I mean, you, you can draw your tag and you know, do all the things you do. And, and it's what you do for pleasure and, and maybe to fulfill your needs. But we have a God who shares all that he has with us. But he says it's all mine to begin with. Who, who can say that, that, I, that, God, they, that they gave to God anything first? God says, no one. I gave it all to them. David said in Psalm 103, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. Not just the beasts, even if you're married to a beast. <laughs> we are his, we belong to him. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship. I like that picture. God is a pretty good craftsman, wouldn't you say? You get a magnifying glass out and you look at... You know, just a beetle, for example, they're beautiful. The colors and, the, and they're so intricately made. He's a craftsman. I mean, whatever it is. But then David said, we're, we're his workmanship. He formed us. He knows us. He knit us together. And we are his. Everybody say, I have nothing. It all belongs to him. I am not an owner. I am a steward. Right? We're stewards. It's not a... The term steward isn't something that we understand like they did in Jesus' time. In, in, in antiquity, people had stewards that were over their household, and they had enormous authority. Joseph was a steward over Potiphar's house. Later, he was a steward over all that Pharaoh had. And... You know, if you were wealthy, you would have stewards that were over every aspect of your house, the food, the entertainment, the business. You had stewards over stewards, and at the very top of the list was the chief steward, somebody that had enormous authority. We, we don't have people like that in our lives. and I mean, I don't know anybody like that. The closest comparison that I could come up with is if you have a retirement account or you have an investment portfolio, you have a money manager that looks over that that account that you've worked hard for, right? And you give them great authority. You tell them that they can invest in any way they want. You just want a return back, right? That, it, they have all kinds of authority. And usually you pick them because you've heard that they do a good job. You didn't pick them because they do a bad job. And you get those monthly reports on how they're doing. And in the last few months, that report's been going down instead of up. You know, it's like, come on, get that money up. And then you hear about somebody else's money manager. Theirs is really good and they have better returns than you and you want to change. You know, it's, we, that's, that's the closest analogy I could come up with, with with what a steward is like. Someone that has something that's yours and they have great authority, and you've given them that thing because you want them to grow it and you expect a return. It is the parable of the stewards that Jesus told twice, two different times during his ministry. But sometimes we forget that we're stewards. We begin to act like we're owners. How would you, how would you like it if you called your money manager and 
you said, hey, I, I need an advance. I need a check. I'm going to buy a new car or I'm going to pay for some medical bills or something like that. And your money manager said, well, you know, I, I kind of think that's my money now. You know, I've, I've had it for 10 years now and I've grown it. I've doubled it. I, I think it's just my money. How would you respond? Probably not very well, right? Depending on your personality, there might be a war. Like, hello, I'm coming to talk to you. Sometimes we, we take what God has given us and we act like it's ours. I mean, here, here's our God. He, he gives us our talents. He gives us our time. He gives us our resources. And he allows us to enjoy those things and benefit from them. He just wants us to give some of it back to him. Think of how blessed you are. How good your life is because of what God has done for you. He lets you enjoy it. But he also asks, asks for us to give our time and our resources and our talent and all that we have back to him. How does he ask? Well, if you're anything like me, it's that still small voice. Kirk, I want you to go do this. I want you to go help them. I want you to use your talent or your time to bless this person in that way. I want you to give to that need. I want you to give to that offering. He speaks to us. He doesn't badger us. You know, it's not, not like those robocalls that you get on your phone, you know, just over and over and over again. You, you know, they just, God just gives us that still small voice and he asks us to be obedient, to give back to him what he's already given us. You have to solve the question of who owns it before you can talk about serving. Because otherwise you're serving with the wrong heart. Did you know that Jesus told a story in the Bible about a person who was a steward who thought he was an owner? It's in Luke chapter 16. I want to read these verses as we go through the story today. This is Luke 16 verses 1 through 8. Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager or a steward, a person who was in charge of his affairs. And mind you, everyone that was listening to Jesus tell the story, they would have understood the concept of stewardship. Many of them would have been stewards. Because of their demographic, because the Israelites were on the lower end, they were servants to a lot of people, they would have related to this. They would have been stewards. And so he's telling this story. There was a rich man who had a manager or, uh, or a steward, a person in charge of his affairs, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be my steward. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? He's taking my livelihood. He's taking all that I have away from me. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too ashamed to beg. And so I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from the management, people may receive me into their houses. And so summoning all his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? You just picture him lining all these debtors up and he goes to the first and he says, how much do you owe my master? And the first said, a hundred measures of oil. And the steward said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, I owe a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill quickly, sit down and write 80. And we have to pause a little bit between verse 7 and 8 because the steward goes down through the list, all of these debtors, and he, he's, not, he's not trying to please his master. He's trying to save his own skin, Right? He said, I've got to do something so at the end of the day when I lose my job and I lose the responsibility I have, I have to do something that people will welcome me into their home. So he lines them up and he says, you owe 80 or you owe 100, now you owe 80. You owe 100, now you owe 50. He's just, he's just paving the way so he has a place to live or to stay at the end of the day. And his master uh, doesn't commend him for his heart, but he commends him for his shrewdness. The master comes to him at the end of the day and he says, he commends the dishonest manager, verse 8 says, for his shrewdness. The word there in the Greek means he, his quick and wise thinking, this plan that he came up with. And then Jesus addressed those who were listening. He said, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. It's a weird parable. But you have to follow or understand what Jesus was saying here. 
he was talking about us being stewards over the things that God has given us. And he says that the sons of the world, when they realize that they haven't stewarded their things right, they're more shrewd, they're quicker to respond than we as Christians. That's the message that Jesus was saying. When we begin to act like we own it, like it's ours, and we're just giving a little back to God when he asks, when we begin to act that way and it's pointed out to us, Jesus is saying, my heart is that you would respond like the people in the world. That you would be quick to say, oh man, God, I'm sorry. I've taken what you have given me and I've used it for my own gain. I've abused it. I've been selfish with it. I've forgotten where it came in the first place. That was Jesus' point in this parable. I want to apply this just to the things that God has given us. He's given us our time, right? We all have the same amount of time. There are people that say, I'm just going to give my money to the Lord. I don't have time. That doesn't honor God. There are other people that say, I'm just going to give my time. I can't afford to give my money. That doesn't honor God either. He owns it all. He gave it all to us. And he lets us enjoy it. He lets us use it. But he asks for us to give some of it back. And he gives us the gift of time. And he asks us to use it for the service of his kingdom. To give to his church. The Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. Now think about that. Jesus walked on the earth and he had a physical body. There was a real Jesus that people could see and touch. And he healed people and he met needs. And there were all kinds of miracles that followed him. And the Bible says in several places in the New Testament that we are now the body of Christ, the church. The local church as well as the church universal. It's used in both senses throughout the New Testament. That means that every local church that preaches the gospel, we are the walking manifestation of the body of Jesus. And so we give to the church so the church can be edified and built up and go out and change the world. And we give our time. God knows how much you have on your plate. He knows you work 50 hours a week or 60 hours a week. He knows that. He knows that you have three kids at home. He knows all the sports. He knows that you're raising your grandchildren. He knows you have foster kids. He knows all that's on your plate because he's all-knowing, right? And he gave you those things. But he also asks for us to give back our time. It's the greatest investment you can make to invest your time in the church. It's way better than Bitcoin or FTX, right? I mean, that's a waste. It will change your children's lives if you invest in the church. Do you know that? It'll change them. Don't give me your money or don't give the Lord your money. Give him your all. You say, well, I don't, I don't have enough time. I don't believe you. Do you have a phone on you today? Just take it out if it's an apple. Turn it right side up first. I might need some help. Go to your settings. You don't have to do this. I'll just, I'll be the illustration. <laughs> Go to your settings. And there's this thing called screen time. If it's turned on, it tells you all that you've done with that phone during a week. Maybe you shouldn't do it. <laughs> and then you click this button, see all activity. Thank God it's Sunday, because it it starts over every week. (laughs) Just today, I've had 30 minutes on my message app. Would you guys quit texting me so much? (laughs) Uh, That that was the number one app on my phone last week, messages. It's just trying to respond to all the the texts that you get throughout the course of a day. Uh, There's Safari, that's my internet browser. Thank God there's only nine minutes on it so far. I was looking up a scripture in pre-service prayer. That's the truth. That's why. But it probably didn't take nine minutes. I might have looked up the duck score too. And then there's BibleHub.com and uh, EnduringWord.com and uh, FoxSports. Oh, man. 
Facebook.com. It says show more. We're not going to go anymore today. But my point is, do this next Saturday. First, you've got to turn it on. But do it next Saturday. The average adult spends, they say, in America, six hours a day screen time. That's telephone calls and texts and, and youth, man. I won't even pick on you. It's more than adults. We have time. TV, stuff. You spend all day Saturday doing something that you want to do. If you will invest in the house of God, and there's, there's no sign-ups today to help out. We're, there, there's no ulterior motive other than to understand correctly that God wants us to give him our time and our resources and our talent. It's the best investment you can make. My, one of my best friends has every toy made. He has a side-by-side and quads and motorcycles and four or five bicycles and remote control cars. I mean, he just plays hard. That's why he's my best friend. And uh, I mean, I like that. Just plays hard. And he works a lot. But he also serves this church about 10 or 15 hours a month. Every month, month in, month out. He's on our worship team. He plays the drums. And uh, he'll play for the youth. He'll come to practice. He'll play for Sunday morning services. He comes and fixes things. He just, he just gives of his time. And he's as busy as anybody I know. But he stewards his time to give to the house of the Lord. And that honors God. I want to challenge all of you to give your time to the house of the Lord. Amen? And how about your talents? Yes, I'm looking at you. Or you, or you, or you. Your talents. Where did they come from? Did you inherit them? Is it DNA? Is it because your dad was artistic that you're artistic? I don't buy that because you can have two kids in the same household. One can't draw a square and one is just amazing. Right? Or, or a mentor that gave you that business acumen or whatever it is. Is that, is that where that talent came from? A person? And if it came from that person, where did they get it? Because I don't know about you, but man, my life's way different than my father's life. Just, it's just, I'm not even remotely close to being like him in so many ways. Some of them aren't so good, but I inherited some things, I suppose. But what talents I have, what things have been spoken into my life, even by mentors, it all came from God. And he asks for our talent back. Not everyone can preach or teach or not everyone's an evangelist. Not, we all have our specific gifts that God gave us. That's why there are so many listed in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. There's all kinds of gifts or talents or abilities that God has given you. And he wants you to use them for his kingdom. You have time and you have talents, and you have resources. You have money. You have finances. It's all the Lord's. Everything I have came from Him. There's there's no possible way that I'm smart enough to have accumulated what the Lord has blessed me with. No way. Uh, If you saw where I grew up... I mean, I grew up in a trailer house, for crying out loud. And, it, and I, I have a friend who grew up in a little dinky house, and he would say, I decided when I was in high school, I didn't want to be like that. I wanted to have, you know, all this stuff, and he is worth a lot of money. But I, that was never me. I just, the Lord has just blessed me with his stuff. It's his. And when I give it to him, I am blessed, and you are blessed. He gives and he takes away, right? It all comes from him. It's a litmus test for maturity. How we give. Are we owners or stewards? We're stewards of all that God has given us. Amen? Would you just lift your hands like this?
it's good for us to surrender that stuff back to him. It's good for us to repent when we start acting like owners when we're stewards, isn't it? Remember the story of the widow, her might? Jesus said she gave more than all of us. It's not what you have, it's the heart you have behind it. So Father, hmm, would you help us to be aware of your voice and when you ask us to give and what you ask us to give. And Father, may we take off the boundaries, the categories, the boxes. Lord, it's all yours. I own nothing. And I want to use what you've given me for your kingdom. God, I want to bless you with it as you bless me. And for some, you're going to say, I want to give you my time. For some, you're going to say, I'm going to give you my resources. And for some, you're going to say, I'm going to give you my talent because those are the areas that you wrestle with. So Father, would you be glorified as we continue to grow in you? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like the ushers to come. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> God loves you so much. <clears throat> There's people, you know, in our church that have massive amounts of assets. And I think that's cool that God gave them those massive amounts of assets because he knew they could be trusted with it, to steward it. Sometimes they're not aware of that. And there are others that don't have much. And it's not because God didn't trust you. I mean, we could have been born in Africa or India, right? It's just what you have is what you have. But I know as we honor God with what we have, he will press it down and shake it together and it'll run over. So church, let's give of our time, talent, and service. Amen. Don't forget, we have Man Church in the Man X at 6.30 on Wednesday. Ladies, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but you can come and do your thing. God bless you. Have a great week. No, it's going to be...